So let me as usual chant something from in Sanskrit uh, before we move into the topic. Mm. It's an ancient mantra. Some of you attended the workshop, so I don't need to say this again, so I'll say something else. So, <clears throat> Om Brahmanandam Paramasugadam Kevalam Jnanamurtim Dvandvatitam Gagana Sadarsham Tattvamasya Tilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalam Achalam Sarvadi Sakshibhutam Bhavatitam Triguna Rahitam Satgunam Tandam I go down to the Supreme Being who happens to be the real Guru, not less. This is what I said just now, in a nutshell. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> the uh, topic given to me today is uh, the Upanishads. It's something about the Upanishads and it's a workshop and then meditation, question answers and so on. So, the main topic is the Upanishad. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the person who sent me the topic on the phone uh, almost fainted because just 10 minutes ago I asked, what is today's subject? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so here we are, Upanishad. <laughs> um, Let me first explain to you, we have enough time, one hour, 15 minutes, one hour, 20 minutes, I'll manage somehow. Um, but it's very important for us to know, since the topic is Upanishad, what is this Upanishad? What does it mean, the word? First, let me tell you that many people are familiar with the word Vedanta. People read Vedanta society, there is Vedanta and so on. Now, Vedanta, the word means the end of the Vedas. So, what is it? Not end of the Vedas, but the last part of the Vedas. Veda, Anta. Right? Now, the Upanishads form the last section of the Vedas. They are also the Vedas. When you say Vedas, people usually think of only the, the Samhita portion, the chanting portion. Veda includes the Samhita, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas and the Upanishad. So Upanishad, let's not, we don't have to go deeply into this. The Upanishad therefore comes at the end part of the Vedas, the literature called Vedas and therefore it's called Vedanta. So the basic teaching of Vedanta is all found in Upanishad. Now the Vedas <coughs> talk about many things. They are supposed to be, uh, it was very lately that they were written down. They were all heard and then uh, somebody else learnt it from by rote, through talking, to speaking. So therefore it's called Shruti because it is that which is heard. Not something which is written down and then you read it and then you analyze it and then you go to sleep and depending on your mood, your interpretation is different and so on. Upanishad is Shruti. The Veda is that which is heard, which means when the mind is prepared, preparation takes time, when the mind is prepared, when the Upanishad is heard, it immediately clicks and one understands. There is no looking at this theory or that. It's straightforward listening. But listening is not easy. Lots of people hear but do not listen. So the art of listening is quite an interesting subject by itself. We will come to that. So let me explain the word Upanishad first. What is Upanishad? The last part of the Samhitas. Upanishad consists of three syllables. It's important to remember this because what we are going to say next is linked to this very intimately. The Upanishad consists of Upa, Ni and Shad. Three words. Upa, 
The word upa in Sanskrit means to be close, to come close. That's why I said now, when I came, we were all sitting far away, and we all come close. So it's ideal for the Upanishad. So upa is when the student went to the teacher who lived in the forest. Why the forest? Lots of oxygen to breathe, fresh air, no vehicle pollution. So the disciple, the, the student, let's not even say disciple, the student went to the teacher in the forest to learn the Upanishad. So how did he learn the Upanishad? There were no microphones, there were no loudspeakers. So how? Close. <laughs> sitting close. So sometimes it's also called the secret, the rahasya, because it was not loudly proclaimed. It was a personal discussion between the teacher and the student. And therefore the word upa means close. Now, it also means not just physically close, because you can be physically close, but your mind may be somebody somewhere else. So, Upanishad, Upa also implies physically close, mentally close, when the minds are together, right? Now, the subject is not understood so much through words, but when your mind and my mind are moving close to each other, when the frequencies are similar, then it jumps. You understand? See, so this is Upa. It also means that the truth that one is searching for, while well, the student goes to the Rishi to find out the truth, what is the truth of the universe, who am I, where am I, why am I linked to this world, how, and so on. So, this truth that the student seeks is so infinite when it is found, it's so infinite that one can't say that I can become the truth. You can only say I can go as close as possible to the truth. Because when you go too close to the sun, you no longer remain, you're burnt. There is only the sun. Uh, a great saint in India once said, to understand the infinite, even intellectually, is like a salt doll, a doll made of salt, trying to find out the depth of the ocean. Why? Oh, your mother came, I didn't see her, I just saw her. <laughs> anyway, so like the salt doll that goes to find out the depth of the ocean. What happens to the salt doll? There's only the ocean, right? After a while. So therefore, you can only go close. You cannot be. You can, when you are close, then you know what it is all about. So, Upa has all these meanings. And since it's a Sanskrit word, there may be another dozen meanings which we are not looking into right now. The language is like that. The toughest grammar, of course, is the German grammar and Sanskrit is not far behind. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> um, upa. Now, the next syllable is ni. And then the last one is shad. So, I'll explain the last syllable first and then come to the center, to the ni. I have my reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Shad means, the literal meaning of shad is sit. Sit down. Why? Because now we are all sitting here together. When you're sitting down, which means you're settled. When you sit at a table to eat, which means you're settled. You're, you're sitting here, I know you're listening to the talk. When one of you gets up and goes, you're no more listening. So shad means to sit. Means sit comfortably, listen to what is being said, and also not only listen to what is being said, also for the teacher to figure out if he's able to convey what he's trying to do. So all this requires some kind of restfulness, not walking up. So sit, shad. Shad also means 
as I said before, that the mind has to settle down. You can sit here, but your mind may not be settled. Maybe at home, did I bring the key or did I forget? Here you don't have to worry, nobody will take anything. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, the mind is not here, it's not sitting down. I am sitting down, but my mind is walking around. So, Shad means also first to understand this truth, which is quite subtle. Therefore, sit down, let the mind settle down. This is the meaning of Shad. Now, all the sadhanas and practices and the yoga that one, do, one does uh, connected to meditation is basically to make the mind settle down, so that one goes closer to the truth. There is nothing else. You cannot, there is no technique to find the truth, but there is a technique to calm the mind so that it senses what is going on. Okay, so then what is this knee in between? A knee is a small syllable indicative of the relationship between the teacher and the taught. Mm -hmm. Which means the taught, one who is learning, sits with the understanding. It actually means down, knee. In Hindi we have a word niche, down. It, mean, it means that the student who is trying to learn is sitting with the attitude that he is going to understand because he does not know. Because the moment I know, I won't listen to anything else. I already know. And then, if I know, then will I listen? No. So, me indicates the attitude of the student who says, well, the person who is teaching perhaps knows, so let me listen without prejudice, without saying that, oh, I have written. Uh, I find this uh, very common in my country because everybody knows Vedanta. You can't speak about it. Everybody knows already. We have a problem there. So, well, I find that also in the West nowadays. Everybody knows Vedanta. <laughs> So, this attitude of listening from a level where I think I don't know, it means to sit down, is the meaning of the word ni, the relationship between the teacher and the taught. And also, in, in, in traditional language, they, in traditional uh, descriptions, they describe that an empty vessel only can receive a full vessel cannot receive. Plus, if you have something here, down, you want to pour something from here, it's possible. If you have this here, how do you pour it? I mean, not this way, but suppose this is empty, huh? and it is like this, can I pour it? No, it will fall down. It has to be empty and it has to be down, so it has to come with the humility that I don't know, so let me try and understand. This is deep. So when all these three things come together, you already have the Upanishad. Moving closer to the truth, sitting close to each other, discussing the matter intimately with the understanding that perhaps I'm going to find out. That needs space also, right? You can't put anything in. There was this uh, student who went to a Zen master. And he said, I want to learn Zen. Um, so the master said, OK, sit down. Let me make some tea for you. He was thinking, what is this now? I, <laughs> I came for Zen. He says, I'll make tea for you. So, OK. Anyway, you, can, you can't do anything with a Zen master. They can be quite eccentric. Might throw you out, so he sat quiet. Don't worry about that here. Huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the Zen master made the tea and brought it. And on the table, there was a cup, empty cup. And the master poured the tea. And this guy is watching. 
He wants to learn Zen, so he's watching the cup. He kept pouring. The cup became full, continued to pour, and the tea started flowing down the table. After a second, this guy said, Sir, the cup is overflowing. He thought he didn't notice. He said, the cup is... Then he put down them. And he said, look, your cup is overflowing. How can I give you Zen? I hope you get what you're trying to say. <laughs> the space. So this all put together is the Upanishad. So enough of, we don't have time, enough of description of what the Upanishad means. Now what are the Upanishads? Is there a body of literature which are called Upanishads? Yes. Attached to each Veda, there are a number of Upanishads. And of them, the eleven Upanishads are called the principal Upanishads. They are the oldest. The rest of the Upanishads come later. And they are called principal Upanishads because they have been commented upon by all the great teachers belonging to different denominations, different uh, ways of life, different philosophies, have all commented on them. Shankara's commentary on the principal Upanishads is well known, of course. Then what is not well known is that the next teacher who came, important teacher in India called Ramanuja, also translated the Upanishads. 11 Upanishads. And then came Madhva, who also translated the Upanishads. In India, we have so many things. People, when they say Vedanta, people generally think only of Shankara, Adi Shankara. But then came Ramanuja, and then came Madhva, and so on. All of them have studied and commented on these Upanishads. Therefore, they call the principal Upanishads, the main, and they are the oldest. So Upanishads like the Ishavashi Upanishad, Brihad, we don't have to remember the names. Uh, some are so short that they have only 12 stanzas, 12 verses. And there are some which are so huge, like having about a 500 to 600 uh, slokas. So there are many kinds of Upanishads. Now I am going to take any one or two of these Upanishads and look at them, so that you get a general idea of what the Upanishads are about. One thing to be remembered is the search that happens in the Upanishad is the search for the truth. Search for that which is permanent, search for that which is not temporary, search for that which is not here today and gone tomorrow, but which is perhaps always there. This is the search. And the search begins when the human being is not satisfied with all that is around him and says, this is not life, there must be something more. Because with all this, you suddenly see death face to face. Ah, you, you think everything is okay? Somebody who you thought would enjoy this is dead. Or you yourself die. So what, what do you do with all that you made? Nothing, you leave it behind. So, when people think of this, then they begin to think, is there some more meaning behind this or is this all there is on earth? Now, Upanishad deals with this. What is there that is beyond? What is there that is beyond and yet right here? In fact, one of the Upanishads says, the truth that you're looking for, the tranquility that you're looking for, the absolute essence of the universe that you're looking for is using the Sanskrit uh, sloka, tad dure, tad vatantike. It's so far and, and it is so near. It's not a contradiction. Uh, suppose we are looking for something which is there, far away. Suppose I want to shake hands with you, sir. Then I have to go there or move forward or my hand must be elastic enough to reach there and shake hands and come back. So she is there and I am here, I am reaching out to her. Right? What if what I seek is everywhere? Suppose what I seek is here, there and everywhere. 
So how do I go? Perhaps when all going stops, you might discover it here. When all reaching out is finished, when all trying to grasp is finished, when all that movement of the mind which is trying to reach from here to there stops, knowing that you can't find it there. Then in that stillness, when there is no reaching out, there is no movement, it's right here. This is the teaching of the Upanishad. Now, should we take up any one Upanishad and look at it? Or should we carry on in general? Why Isha Vasya? <laughs> because the reason I have, uh, I got this name is because in Science Satcharitra, hmm? in Science Satcharitra, Shri Sai Baba Satcharitra, he's mentioned uh, several times, he's mentioned Isha Vasya and a little bit, little bit uh, from Isha Vasya. And I've always been inquisitive as to what is there in Isha Vasya. So this is but I'm not sure if everybody else is inquisitive about it. <laughs> 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 hmm? Okay, since you said we take the Isha Vasya, okay. Now, remember that Isha Vasya is one of the principal Upanishads, okay. And it has only 20 slokas, 20 or 21, don't worry about it. Uh, there is a smaller Upanishad called the Mandukya which has only 12 slokas. I won't take it up because we did it in the workshop. So I don't want to repeat it, although it's so important. But so let's start with the Isha Vashya, one of the Upanishads. Now the Isha Vashya Upanishad starts with a statement, a very beautiful statement. It says, Isha Vashya Medam Sarvam Yatkincha Jagatyam Jagat Tena Tyaktena Bhunjita Makritha Kasya Suddhan not Greek and Latin, I'll talk about it. Uh, so, uh, Isha is the Supreme Lord or the Supreme Being is referred to here as Isha, that Supreme Reality. Isha Vashyam Idam Sarvam, Vashyam means pervades, P-E-R-V-A-D-E-S, pervades. This Supreme Reality mentioned as Isha here, pervades, pervades, idam sarvam, everything that is here. Idam means here and now. Sarvam means everything, sarva. So the sloka, the first sloka is, this supreme reality pervades everything that is here. Why the word idam is used? Because the Upanishad is not teaching you what is after death or what is going to happen tomorrow, but what is happening now? The now is very important for the Upanishad because it's only when you find the now that you can be free of then and later. In fact, to find the now is to begin to slowly free yourself from the then, what happened before. So, it starts with the saying, that supreme reality, let's say it's an assumption or it's a hypothesis, like Pythagoras had an hypothesis. Uh, according to, you know the Pythagorean theorem, the Pythagoras theorem, well here's a match, but Pythagoras theorem, where the square of the base plus the square of the altitude, or is it in two? <laughs> okay. Uh, this the square of the of the base and the square of the altitude will give you this the value the square of the hypotenuse so hypotenuse this is a triangle so this is straight 90 degrees and this is the hypotenuse now as it stands it's a hypothesis in the pythagoras theorem in geometry so, you work towards it and then construct the triangle and you say, okay, I accept this. In the same way, the hypothesis the Isha Vashya Upanishad begins with is that, listen, there is one supreme 
all-pervading reality whom we called Isha, which means the Lord, the Supreme, which pervades everything here. There is nothing there which it does not pervade. And the next sentence explains it by saying, Yatkincha Jagatyam Jagat, that means it pervades everything here that moves, which is the world, the Jagat. In, in Sanskrit, the word used for the universe is Jagat. And the word Jagat is derived from the Sanskrit word Jagatyam, that means that which moves, which means there is nothing that does not move. Everything moves. Everything. Uh, time moves, we all know that. If time didn't move, I would have remained as a six-year-old boy now. Mm -hmm. And I would have had little thicker hair here, little less now. So, move, time moves. And what else moves? Is there anything that does not? Huh? Yeah. The planets move. Even the solar system moves. The whole galaxies are moving. Nothing stops. Everything moves. Um, life moves. Mind. Mind, of course. The most important. Nobody can say it doesn't move. <laughs> it's here now. In the two, half a second it's gone there. And I see, what is she wearing now? And so, <laughs> mind. How the mind moves. So, there is constant movement, motion, which is also what, of course, uh, scientists say, and the physicists say, everything is in constant flux and movement. There is nothing that stops. Therefore, this universe is called Jagat. Jagatyam. Jagatyam means that which moves. Therefore, this entire universe is in movement. The Upanishad says, that supreme reality, which is the essence of this universe, is there everywhere in this moving universe. It means however it moves, this does not move. It is always there. It's almost like a center of a wheel, you know, the wheel moves. The wheel moves because the center is static, otherwise the center will move on, the wheel will go off somewhere. The center is static, uh, it's not static, it's steady and there, and therefore based on the center there is this whole movement. So that Isha, the Supreme Being, is the center which is absolutely quiet and silent. The whole world is moving and therefore it pervades everything because without it, it cannot move. Okay. The other is that you, you must have seen there are many hurricanes and cyclones coming, especially in the US coast, we have a lot of these things going. A cyclone has tremendous power. It keeps moving, but the center of the cyclone, which is called the eye of the cyclone, is a vacuum. And it is this vacuum that sucks everything inside, while the whole thing is moving. So the actual power is in that quiet spot, but what we see is that which moves. That is Isha, the supreme in the middle, silent, and everything is moving around. And everything is sucked in and everything is thrown out, but it's the same. Good news is that we are also part of that. <laughs> we are not the cyclone, but the eye of the cyclone. This is what the Upanishad is all about. Right. Then the next sentence is interesting. It says, Tena tyaktena bhunjita. Therefore, let go and rejoice. Ah. Let go and rejoice. Tena tyaktena bhunchita ma gritha kasya suddhanam. Whose wealth is this anyway? Now, we have to look at this carefully one by one. The last one is very interesting. Whose wealth is this anyway? If human beings begin to think that this wealth, this trees, the earth, all that we have belongs to humanity and not only for myself, 
would make a great difference. That's a different thing. Okay. Anyway, this one, tena tyaktena bhunjita, let go and rejoice, is a tremendous statement. From childhood, we are taught, gather and rejoice. I mean, happiness is somehow linked to gathering. From the time of the hunter-gatherer, with the bow and arrow, we've been gathering and gathering and thinking that more you gather, the more happy you are. Upanishad is saying just the reverse. It says, let go and rejoice. You want real joy, you want real happiness, let go, not hold on. To hold on, to let go is different from giving up. Let go. Not only physically, but also in the mind. The mind is more important, letting go. I'll give you an example. You know why we are, many of us, are in hell all the time? Um, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> because we cannot let go. Hmm. Suppose uh, Karuna, oh, she's compassion, but still, suppose. She uh, gave me a very good slap one day, suppose, in case. You didn't have it. Your name is compassion, you couldn't have, but suppose you did. You gave me a tight slap in some 20, 20 years ago. Were you born 20 years ago? Oh, okay. 20 years ago. Now, that time, See that sound? Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. um, Twenty years ago, when you give me a tight slap, how long does the slap last? Ten minutes? Fifteen minutes? Very tight, maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> it was too tight if my tooth flew out, then maybe a few more days at the dentist. But after that, there is no slap. It's over. But can I let go of it? No. I will carry it in my mind for 20 years, hoping to slap her back. <laughs> Till that slap, which was over and done with 10 minutes ago, I mean, 20 years ago, in 10 minutes, I have carried it for 20 years in my head till it becomes a festering wound, sitting inside and eating my being. Ah, if I see her somewhere, I'll slap. Can we let go? If you could only understand the fact that anything that happens, happens and it is over. It doesn't remain, but where does it remain? In my head, plays like a tape going on and on and on, I cannot get rid of it. If I understand that happiness actually is to get rid of it, I say that it's happened and it's done, I can't go back to the past, it's over. And because of that past, which I am loaded with, burdened with, I cannot enjoy anything in the present. I can't now look at her and say that white thing she has put in her hair looks nice. Because I'm always happy. <laughs> so, can we, therefore, according to the Upanishad, if you really need to rejoice, if you really need to find the essence of your being, which is that silent spot around this whole cyclone of ever-moving things, then you need to let go. There's no other way. More than physical, psychologically. Let go. Physically, yes, you need what you need a certain things to live in this earth and this world and so on. I understand that. But the mind has to be free of all this. Which is when you go to sleep in the night, when you wake up in the morning, is it possible for us to wake up saying this is a new day? Then you are practicing the Upanishad. This is not the old day which was there yesterday. It's gone. Actually, it's gone. Except in our memory, just think about it. 
Where is yesterday now? Except in my memory. What do I have now? Here. Just now. When we go to sleep, it's like a mini death. Actually, it's a rehearsal for the final rest every day. If you sleep. When you wake up, it's a new day. No, but I'll come back with all my old. I'm not saying that you shouldn't recognize your shoes next day and that this is not my shoe. <laughs> that's, that's a pathological disorder. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the mind. <laughs> Can I leave all those wounds and hurts and all those things? But if there are good memories, retain them. Nice memories that help you to rejoice. Can we let go of all these things that burden us? and free ourselves from this. The Upanishad says, this is the essence of finding the reality which pervades everywhere. Hmm? Okay. Now, um, I don't have the Upanishad, it doesn't matter. We need to uh, skip a bit and come to a couple of other things discussed in the same Upanishad. Since you, you dictated that I should. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is one statement in this Upanishad which requires a great deal of thought. <clears throat> it starts with saying, uh, those who worship ignorance enter into darkness. This is understood. We all think we are not ignorant and therefore we look down upon people who say, oh, they are caught up with ignorance, so they are in darkness. So we all say, yes, yes, we shouldn't be caught up with ignorance. Should It's darkness, I understand. But the next sentence shocks you out of this. It says, and he who worships knowledge enters into greater darkness. <laughs> this is from the Ishavashi Upanishad. Andham tama pravishanti yo avidhyayam upasate. Then what about vidhyayam? Enters into greater darkness. Hmm. What does it mean? Two things. One is that the most important part is what we just discussed. It's just an extension of that, which is knowledge. They're saying, he who worships ignorance enters into darkness. Okay, understood. He who worships knowledge enters into greater darkness. And this is how the Upanishads are, sorry. And enters into greater darkness. Why? Just the Upanishad discuss this. Several commentaries on written on this verse. <laughs> Hundreds of pages. Now, it's actually quite, quite simple. Uh, the word defined here is knowledge, right? So, what is knowledge? When I say I have knowledge, what does it mean? Uh, huh? What does it mean? I, I have this, I don't know, uh, I, I see a new thing here. Right now, I don't know what it is, then I look at, oh, this is a matchbox, I understand. And then tomorrow I must remember that this is a matchbox, right? After 10 minutes, if I remember now this is a matchbox, I've understood. 10 minutes later, I don't know, then it's not knowledge. Hmm. So I have understood this. Intelligence is essential to understand that this is a matchbox. Then, when I say I know about a matchbox, it means I have understood this using my intelligence and I have stored it in some cubby hole in my memory and whenever I want I can pull it out and when I see a matchbox it comes out, ah, this is a matchbox. This is so with any knowledge that we have, including science, arts, religion, Upanishad, any knowledge that we have, is understood this way. First, I don't know. 
then I use my intelligence and I understand it and then I store it in my memory and recall it when required. So that means I have knowledge of that. Whatever I can recall from my memory. But don't forget that it is stored in the memory. All knowledge is stored in the memory. The Upanishad says, memory is a thing of the past. You can't have a present memory, can you? The moment I say memory, and the truth which is existing here, idam, now, cannot therefore be a memory. So you cannot have a knowledge of the truth. And anything you have knowledge about cannot be the truth because it is memory and memory is in the past and the truth has to be present. We don't have anything to do with truth which is in the past as a memory. What is the use? Now. We need it now. So what Upanishad is trying to say is that anything that you understand and label and say this cannot be the absolute truth because it has to be right now in the present. So when all that is at rest, eliminated, when the mind is absolutely quiet and tranquil, perhaps then we see that which is here and now, idam. <clears throat> then the last part of the Upanishad, I can't go sloka by sloka because um, the last part of the Upanishad <coughs> says there is a prayer which says, O oh, Supreme Being whose physical representative is the sun, which it shines equally on all. The sun shines on socialists, communists, capitalists, everybody. There is no inequality there. Good, the bad, sun shines on everybody. Right? So they compare the sun to the supreme and say, O oh, supreme being, remove that shining plate which obscures your face so that I can see you face to face and realize that I am not different from you. Now, this dazzling part of the Supreme Being is what catches us and does not allow us to see beyond. What is the dazzling thing that keeps us caught? The objects of the senses which keep us engaged all the time. If we can free ourselves to some extent at least from that, then we will be able to see that which is beyond the glamour that is covering the face of truth. So, this is the, it also ends by saying, after all the body turns to ashes, because in India it's cremated, the bodies are cremated. Okay. We'll deal shortly with one more Upanishad. Just for you to get an idea. I couldn't move out because she said he's a Vash Upanishad. Um, there's another beautiful Upanishad which comes from the Samaveda. Samaveda is a very important Veda. You know that Vedas are four Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Samaveda, and Atharvan Veda. The Samaveda is the third, but it is a very important Veda because it's that, in a way, I would say, that bridges the gap between the visible world and that which is not. Um, the Samaveda is so important that Vyasa has to make Krishna declare in the Gita among the Vedas, I am the Samaveda. He could have easily said, I am the Rig Veda or Yajur Veda, I am the Samaveda. And this Samaveda consists of mostly from the Rig Veda, but all set in music. The, the whole source, the root of all classical Indian music comes from the Samaveda. So Samaveda is, is not chanted, it is sung. They say Sama Gayati, Sama is sung. So in the Samaveda also has, it also has some Upanishads and one of them, now this, shall we dwell five minutes on this thing about Samaveda and music. If you look seriously at ourselves, have you uh, found 
that we all think in a language. I don't know if it occurred to us. But we all think in a language, some language or the other. You cannot even think, conceive of a thought without a language. The Upanishads say that there is a thought without a language. Let me come to that. Okay. Okay, no. Now, most thoughts are, all thoughts are made. There is language inside which formulates the thought or thought formulates the language, whatever. Um, I think that is where the problem is. Because if there could be thought without a language construction, that may be what we are seeking actually. But it is always interpreted, looked at, covered with language. So there is this old story in the Old Testament about the great king Nimrod. His name was Nimrod. He became so full of uh, ego and might, the power of being a great emperor took over him totally. So he decided that he would make a tower so tall that bigger than Burj Dubai, so tall that he could go up to the top of the tower and shoot an arrow at the throne of God. <laughs> we haven't yet come to that, I think. Um, do we know any political leaders today that? Not yet. Maybe coming. Uh, so, so, we will go up and shoot an arrow that it hits God's throne. So he uh, built a big tower. Now, the understanding is in those days there was no language. Mm, it's called the Tower of Babel. People talked with their minds. Everything was okay. And then he built this tower and he went up and he shot an arrow. It didn't reach the throne but it hit the footstool at least. And the Lord got very upset. <laughs> and he punished them. How? He invented language and threw it down. And so, they all started speaking in a different language. It was complete confusion. <laughs> we didn't know what was happening. So the tower fell and everybody killed themselves. Somebody said, oh, I love you. And that fellow thought he's saying, I'm going to kill you. <coughs> language problem, you know, my language, your language. So the root of the word, when, you're, when you say somebody is talking nonsense, is babbling, comes from the Tower of Babel. So, but apparently there must be something which is uh, which is thought and at the same time doesn't have a language. There must be something. That which is beyond we don't know. But in this world also there is something. We can call it the connecting bridge between thought with language and thought without language. And that is music. Yeah. If you really enjoy music, do you need to know German to enjoy Beethoven's? No. Do you need to know Sanskrit, Indian languages to, to enjoy the flute? No. Krishna played the flute, gopis forgot everything. So, here there is no language. Music is the link. Therefore, the Samaveda is given a lot of importance. You see, why is it that music is played in churches? Why is it that people sing kirtans and bhajans? Because there, for some time, you're out of all the constructions of language and definitions. You see, uh, why, why is the call for prayer said in a sing-song voice? Because every day, five times you hear that, then you can't sleep without it. See, it gets into you. So, this music <laughs> is the link between that which is here and that which is there, which is beyond language. So Samaveda. Now, this Upanishad is called the Keno Upanishad and it comes from the Samaveda. 
Interesting Upanishads. There are many Upanishads. I can't, we want time for that. Maybe we should only have a two-day workshop on Upanishads. Very good. Perhaps. Yeah. Then we can sit down and don't ask me about Kriya and all that rubbish. <laughs> Just sit down. <laughs> Just sit down and do the Upanishads. <laughs> so, um, okay. So let me at least touch on Ken Upanishad and then we'll stop and then... What time is the break? 11.45. Ah, so there is time, yes. In between you have you fixed some question answers? Oh yes, so we'll do little more and then have some questions. Ah. After the break we have questions. After the break? Yes. Or which before the break? <laughs> As you wish to go. Okay. okay. So, the Ken Upanishad starts with a beautiful statement. It's a beautiful, it says, um, Sanskrit or English? Sanskrit. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with this beautiful slogan. I'll say that and then translate it because it sounds nice, better than the other language, English in which you translate. Incidentally, do you know that George Bernard Shaw, the great uh, dramatist, he was Irish, although he wrote in English, thought that English is such a wonderful language that if you write G-O-T-T, -T, you should pronounce it as fish. He said, how is this possible? How can G-O-T be fish? He said, I'll explain. This is the wonderful thing about the English language. He said that, for instance, when you say enough, Enough. What is the sound you use for G? Enough. G H. F F. Enough. E N O U G H. Right. So G becomes F. So G is F. Okay. <laughs> what is the sound you use for O in women? E. Women. <laughs> e. Okay. So O becomes I. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have T, T, T. What is calculation? SH. So GOT is fish, he said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me use the other language, Sanskrit. So um, <laughs> it's like. Um, it starts beautifully saying, Kene shitam patati prasitam manaha, Kena prana prathama prayati yuktaha, Kene shitam vacham mimam vajanti, chakshutchotram ka udeva yunakti. This is how it starts. Which means, Kene shitam patati prasitam manaha. Which means, what is it that gives the first impulse to thought in the mind? It's quite subtle. Kineshitam. Kena actually means who or what. You can say who or what. What is it or who is it that gives the first impetus to thought in the mind? Kineshitam vatati prasitam manaha. Kena prana prathama prayati yuktaha. What was the first impulse that made life come onto the earth, to the universe? What is the first impulse of life that came? Or who is it that pushed this first impulse. Kene shitam vacham imam vadati. Who is it that speaks or finds the meaning of words and expresses them when I say I speak? Chakshu chotram. Chakshu is eyes. The eyes. Chotram ears. Chakshu. Kaudeva yunakti. Who is it that hears and sees, when I say I see and I hear. Who is, who is the witness of this? Who is this? Well, the ear is the instrument of hearing, but the ear does not hear, I hear. Through the ear, of course. I is the instrument of perception. But the eye doesn't see, I see through the eye. So who is it? <laughs> See? So the, this is how it starts. Then it makes a very funny statement. 
इट सेज दिस हु इज श्रोत्रस्य श्रोत्रम मनसो मनायत वाचो इट मस्ट अपियर दैट दे ट्राइंग टू कन्फ्यूज यू विच मीन इट इज द आई ऑफ द आई एंड द ईयर ऑफ द ईयर एंड एंड सो ऑन एंड सो फोर्थ चक्षुष चक्षुर अधिमुच्य धीर प्रत्यास्मलोगात अमृता भवंती इट इज दैट द आई ऑफ द आई एंड द ईयर ऑफ द ईयर द माइंड ऑफ द माइंड एंड सो ऑन नोइंग विच द एंशियंस became immortal <laughs> knowing that essence which sees when i say i see knowing that essence that says i hear when i hear knowing that essence which is the first impetus of life on earth knowing that essence which is the first impulse of thought that comes into the mind knowing that they say adimuchya dhira the courageous ancestors of ours amrita bhavanti reach that stage of immortality undyingness this is the kind of upanishad so the whole of this upanishad is how to find out that essence because of which we see we hear we feel and which is also the essence of this universe the beginning of life and so on and so forth so you see how deep the upanishads are they deserve to be studied carefully step by step one by one don't worry about the language uh, there are good incidentally a man from germany went and first translated it into german and then it came out into english and his name was max muller <coughs> he loved sanskrit because he loved german grammar and he said here is something <laughs> so in fact in india we have max muller bhavans where studies are conducted on the vedas and so on uh so i, I don't want to go too much into the upanishads because we cannot do that in this short while but please remember that these are the upanishads they deal with the essence of life what is our true essence where has this universe come from and so on and so forth um now having spoken in such abstract ways the upanishad as it goes on ends in a beautiful story this can upanishad this is very interesting the upanishad you would suddenly say oh my god this is getting too much for me and then you hear a story and then your mind is all settled but the story gives you the essence of what has been what they trying to teach you with this abstract language expression and the story that comes at the end of the sorry of the keno upanishad that was a vada i burped it is the story that uh, comes at the end of the keno upanishad is uh, interesting the supreme being let's say it's a story okay do you enjoy harry potter so that's fine <laughs> uh, so mm, the supreme being decided one day to present himself on earth and test the devas you know devas the word deva in uh, in india in sanskrit means the gods now when you say the gods it's not god one but gods plural which means all the energies that control our senses are called gods which are the senses like uh, <clears throat> the five senses that we have what are our five senses what are the five senses that human beings possess which is common to the russian and the ukrainian what are the five senses so simple Mm. eyes Taste. instruments of perception eyes uh ears nose for smelling mm. no nose into unnecessary thing <laughs> no. and <laughs> and tongue taste skin touch these are the five senses so the gods reign over these senses so the senses are the gods 
Hmm. And uh, also the powers of nature, wind, uh, fire, uh, water, earth, sky, mm, and the sense organs, the sex organs. Yeah, the sex organ works with all these together in tandem. It cannot work without. Mm. So all these put together are the gods. So there's a god of wind, there's a god of fire, there's a god of and so on. And there is of course Indra, the lord of all gods, who is the god of the senses, of the sense organs. So, one day, after proclaiming their greatness, the gods are all standing together and having a chat. Hmm? When suddenly the supreme being decides to test these gods and find out where have they progressed. So he comes in the form of a yaksha. The word used in the Upanishad is yaksha. You can't define yaksha, it means a non-human being. Right? It's there. We don't even know if it's a form or no form, but the yaksha comes and stays there. So the gods are chatting, suddenly they turn this. What is that? So uh, the, the most powerful god of all uh, is the nature, what most powerful thing in nature is fire, Agni. Agni has been worshipped for ages in India, the fire god. You know, it's fire came that cooking started. Unless people died because they didn't pick up something and eat it without cooking. Uh, fire, fire sacrifice has always been there. We always offer things into the fire. It's for warmth, it's for combustion and so on and so forth. It's also the fire of digestion. It's also the fire of desire. Somebody is always fired with enthusiasm. Nobody is watered with enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> fire. <laughs> so, fire, Agni. In Latin, Igni. Your ignition switch, without which you can't start your car. So, Igni. So, fire is a very proud god. So he says, let me go and find out. So fire goes there, Agni goes there. And he's about to ask him, who are you? When the question is asked to him, who are you? Agni says, I am the god of fire, I am Agni. What can you do? I can burn down this entire earth. Huh? I can reduce everything to ashes, I am so powerful. Huh? So the Aksha plucks a blade of grass, and holds it and says, burn this. So Agni burn, tries to burn, he blows, he does all kinds of things, but he can't burn this blade of grass. He's confused. So he goes back and he says, I don't know who this fellow is. I can't burn that blade of grass that he holds before me. So the Lord, the God of uh, wind, why says, let me go. So he goes. So the Aksha asks, who are you? He says, I am the lord of uh, wind. I can make cyclones. I can blow the whole earth away. Huh? I am the lord of wind. Huh? So the Aksha is still holding that blade of grass. So he says, blow this. He huffs and he puffs and he does everything that he knows. Hmm? Can't blow the blade of grass. So he comes back and he says, this is confusing, man. I don't know what to do because I can't seem to blow this uh, strina, this little blade of grass. So Indra, the lord of senses, the chief of gods, the king of gods says, let me go. He goes there. But when he goes there, he cannot see the yaksha at all. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes back defeated. And he says, what is this? I went there and I can't see this. From far I thought I saw, but then there's nothing there when I went. The senses cannot find that. When they are completely closed and settled, then perhaps there's a chance of knowing what that is. Anyway, he comes back and he says, I don't understand this. So then suddenly, a beautiful lady, Every now and then in the Hindu scriptures, a beautiful lady. <laughs> a beautiful lady. Yeah. And she is the daughter of the Himalayas. 
Parvati, the wife of Shiva, the daughter of the Himalayas, uh, she appears and described as very beautiful. Pahushobhamana, she appears very beautiful. And the gods are all fascinated looking at her. And then she says, what kind of fools are you? <laughs> what happened? You, you, it's the energy which operates through you. It's the basis of all your energy. Do you think you can overrule the yaksha? Who is the supreme being? He told Indra, she says to Indra, you cannot see him because the senses cannot find. She says to wind, you cannot blow him because he is the essence of wind itself. She says to the fire, you cannot burn him because he is the ignition capacity that you possess. Is that? How can you be against it? How can you do anything with him? So then they learn that all the senses cannot touch that when the senses are quiet. And there is no physical seeing, there is no hearing, and everything is quiet. Then perhaps it manifests itself, because it is right here. It's nowhere outside. The Upanishad declares, Tattvamasi, you are that, you are not this. You are not this body which, with its various problems and things, you are that. Hmm? So this is another Upanishad. So there are many such interesting Upanishads. Eleven Upanishads are the principal Upanishads. Then there are other minor Upanishads. Please remember, there are also twenty Upanishads which are called the Yoga Upanishads, which describe they are the first material you get on the practice of yoga. The Yoga Upanishads, uh, which also are now available in English. <laughs> Fortunately, for it. Yoga Upanishad, some names of Yoga Upanishad. Mandala Brahmano Upanishad, uh, um, Soham Upanishad, um, uh, oh, there are many. I, I, I'm growing old. Uh, <laughs> there are more than 20, 21 Yoga Upanishads, and they're ancient because they're de derived from the Krishna Yajurveda, which is the next Veda after Rig Veda. And whatever has come later in Yoga Pradipika and Yoga Sutra, they are all already there in these Upanishads. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, what did I say? No, what were we talking about before that Yoga Upanishad question? Mm. Ah. Yeah, there are some people here from Kerala, some people who know Malayalam, no, I don't know. one or two people, I'm sure. We cannot find any place on earth without somebody from my state. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a story that Columbus discovered America and he was standing on the beach saying, ah, I found a new land, when suddenly somebody from my state, Kerala, came and said, hey, what are you looking for? Do you want tea? So, <laughs> mm. so anyway. Um, why I said this? There is a beautiful bhajan which is sung. It's called Kirtana, which means praise to the Lord, which is sung in the evenings. It's in Malayalam. It's sung in the evenings. It sounds like a Kirtan, but it's actually quite deep Vedanta. One of the verses, uh, I don't know what to, but the Malayalam you won't understand, so should I say it? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it, it says, Kannu manamagum kannu, adhine kannu aidunna purul, anandariyu malav anandam indu hari narayanaya namaha. Now, hari narayanaya namaha means I bow down to hari narayan, the supreme being. That's the last part. The first part is, Kannina kanna manamagum kanna. That means the eye of the eye is the mind. Hmm. It's the mind that sees. <laughs> the eye of the eye is the mind. Adhina kanna idunna purul. Suppose I discover that I am actually the eye of the mind too. How blissful it should be. Hari Narayana. <laughs> so this is what Upanishad teaches in the Ken Upanishad. 
that while the senses are the instruments of perception, while the mind perceives through the senses, there is something which is also perceiving the mind, which is not of the mind, but which is beyond. And one's true identity is that essence, which is also the eye of the mind, which is also seeing the mind. When this is understood, then one is in bliss. I mean, this is what it says. And then it says, Hari Narayana. You know. So, I think we should stop now. And, uh, <coughs> huh? It's 11.39. So. No, what is the time? 11.39. 11.39. I know, but what is the program? No, no, we stopped for 15 minutes. Now? Or, or if you want to continue with question answer. Yeah, maybe we will. What do you suggest? You decide, please. Uh, lunch more or less at 12.30. Yeah, so there's but still. Please, it's up to you. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, any questions to be discussed mm, based on what we did today, not something else? Mm. <laughs> Because there are innumerable questions. You ask me about Bhagavata, I will. Now. Upanishads. So, what we discussed right now is that how important it is to study Upanishads. And at the same time, studying, understanding, creating memory, which we cannot call later. Isn't that a contradiction? No. I, exactly what it is this way. You know, there was a, a fakir. You know what's a fakir? Mm -hmm. Who is a fakir? It's a wandering uh, yogi who pro probably doesn't even have a home to stay. A homeless is not a good word these days, but um, <laughs> homeless. <laughs> Which means everywhere is his home, let's say. Uh. So, there was some such, one such fakir who used to live in Shirdi. Nobody knew whether he was a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian, nobody knew. He was a fakir living under a tree in Shirdi, in the rural area of Shirdi. Now it's no more rural, but those days. And uh, he used to just tie a cloth on his head and wear a white shirt and sit there and talk to people who came. So, one day, somebody read the Bhagavad Gita before him, where the discussion was about knowledge and how the Supreme Being is beyond knowledge and then you cannot find it through knowledge and so on. So, uh, they thought that this Fakir who, is he, who was supposed to be illiterate, didn't know anything about the Gita or anything. They thought that this, this guy wouldn't be knowing anything about the Upanishads, Gita and so on. Anyway, after this was discussed and everybody went off, there were only a couple of people left there. And one of them was the guy who was discussing this. He told him, I'm going to tell you a story about a man who went barefoot on the grass, on the ground, and a thorn, big thorn got into his foot, big thorn, it was very painful. So he sat down and looked around, I need to take it out. He tried with his finger, but he couldn't take the thorn out, so he checked around. And then he found there was another slightly longer thorn lying there. So he picked it up. And with that, he pressed and took out the thorn that had gone into his heel. Then he asked him a very peculiar question. After saying this, he said, after taking out the thorn, did he put this thorn back there in the heel or did he throw both out? <laughs> I said, of course you throw both out. He said, the thorn of ignorance was in the heel. The thorn of knowledge was used to take it out. After that, you can't stick the thorn of knowledge there, you have to throw both out. 
This came from a person who had no understanding. I mean, people thought he didn't know anything about the scriptures or the books or the film. It's a very simple statement. So, knowledge is required to find out that in the absolute essence, it is of no use. <laughs> but without knowledge, how will you understand that? <laughs> hmm. Is it because uh, real knowledge is um, the experience and not nothing to do with the mind? Yes, you're right. It's a, it's an answer actually, not even a question. What you said just now. Yeah, yeah. That's right. In the same time, we acquire this through senses. Yes, you cannot acquire any knowledge unless the senses are working. But that is the only function of the senses. After that, they have no function. In the usual Shabbat Shabbat Upanishad, there is a strange verse that says, Om Kratos Mara, Kritam Smara, Kratos Mara, Kritam Smara. Give me that paper. Last sloka, yes. Remember nice. what has yes, been yes, done. Yes, yes, got it. And I don't you don't understand. Hmm. See the Vayur Anilam Amritam. There should exhale the immortal wind now that this body is ending in ashes. Pasmantam Shariram. Kritosmara, Kritam Smara, Kritosmara, Kritam Smara. Which means this is something. This last part of the Ishavashi Upanishad, the 17th sloka, is actually sung in death ceremonies when people are dying. Unfortunately, today also they are sung, but the guy who is dying doesn't understand what is being said because it is in Sanskrit. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> now, it means the body will now end in ashes. Now you will exhale and inhale the immortal wind. That means what you are going to in exhale and inhale now is not, not the ordinary wind because the person is probably gasping for breath while he's going or he has left through the wind. How does one die? When one dies, the last thing that happens is the breath goes out. One final breath and it is over. They are saying this breath has now joined the immortal breath which is breathing always in this universe which is the supreme being. The body, basmantam, shariram, the body is ending in ashes now but this is not so easy to remember. When you are leaving the body, if somebody sits and says you are turning to ashes, let your wind join the immortal wind and so on. Who is listening? There is pain, there is attachment, you can't leave the body. So they are repeating, Om Kritos Mara, remember this when you go. Please remember, don't get caught up in this pain. Remember what you have done. Remember why you are going now. Remember again, Krita. Remember what was done. You must remember what was done. That the immortal breath, the, the breath has joined the immortal breath. Remember this when you go. When the body is left behind, one is free. Now on this, I need to say something. The Tibetans have an elaborate system of which is called the Bardo. In the Bardo system, there are monks sitting down near you when you are dying and chanting. What they are trying to say is the same thing in different language, in Tibetan language, that your wind, your breath is joining the immortal breath. The body is going to turn, they don't turn to ashes, the body is going to die. Hmm. Remember, remember, remember that you are not this body or the mind, so that you are free when you go. So this is to be actually chanted when somebody is passing away, but in a language which can be understood by that person. 
no point in just chanting in Sanskrit if one doesn't know the Sanskrit. So Maybe the senses can still perceive, right? Mm -hmm. Even if he doesn't understand the language, the senses can still... No. Mm -hmm. How will the senses understand if the senses have not been accustomed to that language? All senses work on language, right? That's what we were discussing. So, we need to make them understand what is being said, then they will pass on and be free. Okay? The other thing, something I wanted to tell you in this regard. Ah, the fear of death. <laughs> so, you got a nice piece of show. <laughs> uh, the fear of death, since we are on the topic. Seriously, we think that we are afraid of death because it's unknown. Maybe it is the end or maybe we are going, if we are still living, into something that is unknown. This is the fear. But actually it's not the fear of the unknown so much. If you look carefully, it's the fear of leaving everything behind which we consider to be dearest and we can't do without it. So on, if somebody guarantees, okay, you are going to die tomorrow, but when you die, you can take your home, you can take your car, you can take your husband, your lover, whoever, or your children with you, who is afraid of death? But then we are afraid of death because we have to leave behind. This is the main fear. So when a person is dying, that is the main thing that afflicts the mind. I'm leaving behind everything, all that. Right? doesn't belong to anyone. Ma Gritha Kasya Siddhvanam, who is this anyway? We have seen people coming, people going. The poorest person passes away. The billionaire passes away. Some point we need to leave it. Right? We have still not come to the place where body has become immortal yet. I hope not. <laughs> it's good enough for 60 years. Huh? Yes. Sir, I was asking, uh, we don't fear the, like, death is coming, we all know we are going to die. It's not uh, that we are leaving everything and that's why we are afraid. Then what are you afraid? It's like, uh, how it will come to us. What? It's going to be a very painful death. How are we going to die? That is, uh, that is the most frightening thing. Yeah, but when somebody is unconscious, you don't feel anything. Sometimes people are not unconscious, they go through such a lot of pain. misery and pain yeah. and then they finally somehow die. Believe me, the greatest pain is the pain of leaving behind all that you love and possess, more than the physical pain. Both work together. Even if there is no physical pain, people are still afraid of death because not so much about the unknown, it's about you leave all that is familiar and close to you and you're going. Don't even know whether you're going anywhere, but suppose I decide, yes. <coughs> so how do we prepare for death? Like the, can, can First be aware that death is going to come to everyone. Not, let's not talk too much about death, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we should be <laughs> aware that death is going to come anyway. So get prepared for that, which means say that all these things are not going to help me. When I go, if suppose I wear a silk robe, am I going to be saved? No. <coughs> so prepare oneself from the day one, saying that one day I'll have to leave everything. I can keep it now as long as I'm here, but I'll have to leave everything and be ready to go. Hmm? Uh, how do we know we are on the right path and that we are progressing? Which part? The path on our journey. Which journey? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that we all wish to be. I don't know how to explain that. You know something? Anyone who is following a spiritual call, who wants to go beyond the ordinary, who wants to be free of the pain and sorrow of this world, who wants to be resting in peace, not after death, R.I.P. Uh, and so on, 
anyone who has started on this journey needs to go. The only sign, the first sign of progress is not that you had some visions. Visions can be had with hallucinogens. You can take LSD and have wonderful visions, right? Or something else. Or you may uh, be able to sit for some longer time and meditate. The main sign of a person progressing on the path is that the mind is able to stay tranquil under all circumstances. Sarvatra Samabuddhaya At all times, under all conditions. That's why you shouldn't trust a guru like me. Because now I'm smiling, who knows how I'll behave if the car is stolen. Not my car anyway, it's his car. <laughs> so, the first step... <laughs> in short, <laughs> the first step is, is your progress. Is can you keep the tranquility of your mind under all circumstances? Not only when you are sitting down to meditate, which is of course good. Second, am I becoming a better person? Hmm? Other things coming, don't worry. Am I becoming a better person? Uh, am I a, more thinking only about myself or am I thinking of others also? Am I doing anything for someone or am I still self-centered? Sometimes it happens. In this spiritual pursuit, we get too self-centered also. Where I'm looking for the self. Not the small self, but... <laughs> okay. Now, if both these things are there to some level, then the next thing to watch is when I sit down to meditate, am I able to meditate quietly and settle into it without any distractions? Well, I would say that is the third point. If these things are there, then you would be able to do that. So, a spiritual path is not merely practicing your techniques, whatever you are doing, or spending some time in prayer and meditation, which is important, I'm not saying it's not. But in daily life, how do you carry yourself? This is very important. Am I kind? Am I still that not, you know, like... Believe me, every human being has some good and bad qualities. Is it possible for us to live by ignoring the bad traits of other people? And looking only at the good side, it is possible. If this is happening, you are moving on the path. Seriously. It, it's not easy. Huh? I know that... Uh, you know why? Because human beings are governed by gunas. Which in Sankhya terminology, Sattva, Rajas and Tamogunas. And everyone has some ratio or the other. Some more sattva, some less sattva. So the idea is to improve from tamoguna to rajoguna, which is action, and move towards goodness, which is sattva. You cannot get rid of goodness. It will be there. In absolute silence, there is no good or bad. That time it may fall off by itself. You can do nothing about it. So, step one, if one doesn't have traits which are good for others, which are not only selfish, develop them. Sit for periods of meditation and try to absorb your mind in it yourself and see that you don't get agitated under circumstances in daily life. Because we cannot judge this in isolation. If you are sitting in a cave and meditating for 10 years, seriously. But sometimes I see some books in which somebody says that I was living in a cave in isolation for 25 years. And then there is a photograph of this guy sitting in the cave. So who took the photograph? <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, 
so suppose I sit in a cave for 20 years and meditate. Difficult nowadays, but suppose I did for 10 years. Now, how do I really know if I can be tranquil under all circumstances? Because there are no circumstances there. Hmm. How do I know that I am free of anger? How am I? How do I know I am free of jealousy? How? Because there is nothing in that cave to be either jealous of or get angry with the walls of the cave. There is nothing. It's when I come out of the cave and come into society. So, which is why I am saying that spiritual life should not be disconnected from society. It's society which is the uh, uh, testing ground for you, actually. So, when you come out of the cave and get into a bus, and somebody kicks you on the leg, then we know where we stand. <laughs> hmm? Especially if it's a stiletto heel, you got it. <laughs> then, so that's when you have to be. So what I'm trying to say that these things cannot be done in while it's a good idea to take off periods of isolation and go and sit somewhere, but I don't want to call it isolation. That sounds terrible. Solitude. Mm -hmm. Go sit quietly for a few days, take off. In Switzerland, just go off to Murin. <laughs> and in one of these places, sit in one of those beautiful cottages up there, meditate and do on, but do come out and test how you behave and come out of there. Mm. Yes? Yes. Uh, I wonder yeah, uh, how to discern how to how to discern those inner voices between something I call intuition and the other one, the spiritual ego. Mm -hmm. and I, I realized a, a few times that I'm not trusting the inner voice. And how, how do I make this discernment? Um, it's very common that um, sometimes the thoughts that come in our mind are mistaken to be intuitions. And then you act upon it and it ends in disaster, then you know that it cannot be an intuition, right? So, the only thing I can say about this is when the mind becomes quiet and tranquil, when it's not attached or is not pulled on this side or that side, when it is, has come to a state where it can stay in balance and stability, then what occurs in the mind could be an intuition. Not when the mind is in its agitated state. It cannot be. This is very important. Now also, the intuition should be coming from a mind which is not influenced by any chemicals. If the mind is influenced by chemicals of any kind, solid or liquid or gaseous, then <laughs> uh, <laughs> then one cannot distinguish between the clarity of intuition and whether it could be intuition which is muddled up by these influences. The clarity will not be there. So, it takes time to discover this. The best thing of course is to ask somebody uh, like me, uh, <laughs> like me, <laughs> and say, well, is this intuition or is it something else? But the one criteria I have for spiritual aspirants, if there is an intuition, if you really feel an intuition, it will not be something which will ask you to cause harm to anybody else. This is clear, absolutely. No, you are okay. You know, some intuitions are okay for you. Some may be a little muddled. It's okay. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anywhere in the Vedas or Upanishads a description of Atma given? All the Upanishads have described Atman as that which cannot be defined. <laughs> 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 so going beyond that. You cannot go beyond that. <laughs>
when everything else has subsided, then there is only the Atman. So, um, to continue what, what she has said, um, I've, so for you, I've learned it's really important to work in society and work to be in solitude, but also give, give back to the people. And um, I now start working in a, um, in a school as a teacher mm -hmm. for, for children which are not so easy. Mm -hmm. And I just I just started, and it's very. Um, I always feel when it's really easy. They, I feel like my mind is sitting in front of me, like chattering, and uh, like I'm off for a little moment, and they're like, yeah, and I completely lost them, and they are, then they become loud, and then I lose their attention, and um, I found I found a way of <laughs> of getting the attention back. But How? Okay. How? <laughs> Mm. Um, I, I always have some <laughs> some chapters of the Yoga Sutras and the Upanishads with me, and when they when they don't listen and they don't follow the rules I give, then I'm always giving them homework like, oh, no, you really want some Upanishads? <laughs> Did it help? Yes. It helps. It helps. Yeah. Nice. Yes. But it's um, how do I co connect them more with? with all this because they, they, they are really co concerned with entertainment. Like yes, the, yes, yes. The, the, the whole thing in their life, uh -huh. all these videos and video games. Ah, so interest them in, this is the importance of the Puranas, you know, those texts which have lots of stories in them. Mm -hmm. So have videos and have all that and show it to them. Uh, in fact, I will, I must not, I'm not, this is not blaming the writer, of course, he did an excellent job. But if you go back and look at some of the stories in the Mahabharat, in the Ramayana, in the, in, in the Bhagavad, you find stories which are more interesting than Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. So, the children want entertainment, so lead them through this. Show them some videos, let them enjoy, then they say, who is this fellow? Then you explain who this is, why he is doing this particular act. You, children cannot directly, uh, at that age, go into the study of a Upanishad. Things. It's very difficult for them. So we need to go only this way. I feel sometimes that's why some teachers entertain you a lot before they give you serious teachings. True way. <laughs> It's a good thing, but don't give up that children, teaching the children. It's a wonderful thing. It keeps you balanced between this and... Do you know each other? No, we do. <laughs> <laughs> now I think we can talk. Fresh air. Hmm? Some fresh air. Fresh, fresh air, air, yes. <laughs> Little bit of fresh air. And we come back at what time? 2.30. 2.30. So, we'll do a little more and then there is something on meditation and the Upanishads and so on. So.